Welcome to the Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. In this unique format, which is realized in partnership with the Federal Ministry of Education and Research and Springer Nature, we have created an intimate space for interaction with global science leaders, emerging innovators, and entrepreneurs. You, our audience, are encouraged to actively participate in this dialogue-oriented conversation and engage in discussion with our guests. My name is Alid Lücken. I'm a senior editor at Nature Communications, the open access flagship journal of the Nature Portfolio. If you are in the audience and have a question, please raise your hand and we'll try to get to your question. Now that we've got this housekeeping out of the way, it is my great honor to welcome Simone Schwanitz. Uh, at this Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversation. With a background in political science and economics, you spent many years in politics on the state, national, and European levels, and you are now the Secretary General of the Max Planck Society. Um, so can we begin by um, learning a little bit more about you and how you ended up in this role as Secretary General of the Max Planck Society, so MPS and your current role? Yeah. So yeah, the short version would be that uh, for me, it's just a dream come through because I really admire the Max Planck Society. And so then it was a kind of luck, timing and um, ambitions and I would say hard work. But so the, the, the longer version is um, that al already during my PhD um, um, period, I uh, recognized that I'm very good at managing uh, processes, um, organizing conferences and bringing people together. And then I thought maybe it's good for me to support science, but to be not any longer in science. And then just uh, by accident, I saw a um, job um, advertisement uh, for an advisor for a parliamentarian group in the Deutschen Bundestag, an advisor for science and research policy and I thought that may be a good entrance to um, the supporting side of science and research um, and uh, I spent there two years and then uh, after that I worked um, in different ministries um, in uh, Germany uh, and gained a lot of experience. I also was deputy minister in Baden-Württemberg and head of the department of research and science. And then after all that, I was very happy um, that uh, the Max Planck Society asked me uh, to uh, be their secretary general. And so there I am. Great to hear that it's a dream come true, your current role. Um, so the MPS is a uniquely German yeah. organization. For our international audience, could you maybe explain a little bit more about the organization itself and what? Yeah, know? yeah. Um, that is really true because a Max Planck Society is really unique. You can't find anything comparable um, worldwide. We are um, publicly uh, publicly financed by the um, uh, governments of the Länder of Germany and by the federal government. Uh, we have a budget of 1.8 um, billion euros um, per year. Uh, we have 24 employees. We have eight. 8,000 um, junior scientists. Um, but what is special about us is that we are really totally free to choose our topics. So we have four uh, guiding principles. The first is uh, we doing cutting edge basic research. It's only curiosity driven. There's no mission involved. It's just, just curiosity driven. Um, and then we um, are looking for a new path in science and research. We also depend on trust um, and you can see that that we really um, give a great um, security to all our directors uh, to spend their money. They don't have to apply for third party funding. We really provide them with very good uh, um, working conditions when they are on board. And we also have uh, constantly renewal uh, ourselves to find the new paths of science and research. So you just mentioned it. One of the four main pillars of the MPS is basic science, um, so fundamental science. Currently, the world is searching for fast, innovative solutions to address various problems, right, from ending world hunger, which we just heard about, to climate change. So what, in your view, is the role of fundamental science mm -hmm. in helping to solve these global challenges? 
Ja, as I just uh, mentioned before, we are only curiosity driven. There are no missions given to us. But beside that, our scientists and researchers are all very much involved in the great questions and also in the great challenges. So that's uh, why uh, we also contribute a lot. First of all, maybe one example um, when it comes to climate change. Um, one of our Nobel laureates, uh, Professor Klaus Hasselmann from the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in Hamburg, just uh, got this Nobel Prize last year um, in, um, in, in physics uh, for his uh, fundamental w uh, works, uh, which then explained that the climate change is really made by us, by us humans. And so this was um, the fundament for all what came then afterwards. So I would say that um, basic research here really could lay the um, grounds for everything else. And then um, when we are good and uh, when we are lucky, then um, it's also possible that we find disruptive solution how to change and address the global challenges. For example, CRISPR-Cas is a totally new method um, how you can do um, 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 this kind of research um, afterwards. And so this is really something new for us also to uh, supply uh, food for, for everyone um, and, so, um, and so on. So you can also find examples in that. And you also can see it from the um, COVID um, pandemic. Uh, so um, at that time, uh, there was uh, already for 20 years a lot of research done in the mRNA um, method. And then out of a sudden, it was uh, possible to develop drugs for us all to um, prevent uh, even more catastrophe than we had at the time. Right. And oftentimes these applications might not have been the initial motivation to do the research, right? And might be discovered decades later, right? Yeah, I would say that um, the motives at that time were not clear because mm. when you looked into the mRNA, um, there was no idea about COVID. <laughs> In the end, uh, there was the idea maybe you can use uh, or develop some drugs uh, against cancer, but um, so that it could be applied for COVID that was uh, not at the beginning. And uh, the, the um, basic research from Klaus Hasselmann was about um, uh, turbulences. And uh, it was um, an, an, an article in uh, going back to uh, 76. So it was a very specialized article, not even recognized at that time very broadly. So I would not say that this was because he then wanted to um, re solve the climate problems. So this really was to find out more about turbulences and then get deeper in the problems and find out something else and then um, come up with um, such a result in the end. Right. I'd now like to transition to a question that might be of interest to people in academia who might be joining this, this call. So PhD students and postdocs. So one major issue of the academic career are the short-term contracts and limited number of permanent positions, which are mostly reserved for professors. How, in your opinion, can we make the academic career more attractive and reliable without losing talent? Yeah. So this is really important um, to us um, as Max Planck Society. We really depend on the brilliant young minds. Uh, we really like to support them as uh, good as we can. And so um, according to the PhD candidates, we have uh, really strict rules. Uh, there's a, a guideline how to, um, uh, to uh, supervise uh, our PhD candidates. And um, we provide um, three-term contracts as the initial contract for a PhD candidate, and this is for every PhD candidate. And then when uh, this time um, maybe is not enough to finish the PhD, there could be a prolongation for another year. And uh, beside that, uh, we also demand uh, that uh, the uh, candidate should really focus on um, his or her PhD. Uh, so um, this is a contract which uh, allows you to concentrate 100% on your PhD. Um, even you should not attend too much uh, conferences and so on, but there is nothing else you have to do um, then uh, besides concentrating on the PhD. Um, so this is really important um, to us and we also have thesis advisory uh, committees and we have often um, also a second supervisor to um, help you with your PhD. But then in the end, when you finish the PhD, only about, I would say, 80 or a little bit um, uh, more than 80% will leave academia. 
most of them go to industry, to, um, um, to government, uh, to ministries and so on. So this is great. So we also help them to find the best place for them to work. And then for the other um, um, who would really like to stay in academia, then we really try to support them even more. For the Germans, it would be good to have a postdoc period um, um, somewhere else than in Germany. Um, and then when they come back, they also will get some more the next contract in our society. But this is also not a permanent contract. And that is the critical part. But for, we would say that for this initial uh, for this um, uh, additional um, uh, period of where they can work with us as a um, research group leader, they really have the freedom to do what they want. And they can establish themselves as international known researchers. And then most of them really will find a very good position um, either as a professor or um, maybe also as a director at the Max Planck Society. But you really need this period after the PhD to get a, a real well-known established researcher in the field to find something where you can settle down. And we cannot really shrink that kind of period because then it's so much pr pressure for the uh, junior scientist after the PhD to get uh, to uh, for, uh, to get a professorship. That would be not good for the science and research system. Right. You briefly mentioned uh, in your path of how you got to your current role that you spent some time in politics. So I'd be very curious to know about how you experience that dialogue between politics, policy and science and some of the challenges or also opportunities that you saw yeah. in that dialogue. So, yeah, maybe I, I should some words uh, where I spent my day, um, my my. Um, my uh, professional career was in a ministry, it's not in politics. So um, I'm just um, a bureaucrat, um, a civil servant. I worked there as a civil servant in a ministry and not as a politician. So, um, And I always, um, as uh, civil servants do, uh, support a minister, but I'm not uh, a politician. So, um, yeah, we had several experiences. Uh, first of all, um, uh, scientists and researchers advised us also, um, during the um, pandemic, uh, we had a supervisory board for the prime minister uh, just to discuss what should we do? Should we close the schools or should we open the kindergartens and so on and so forth? So and then they are also my most favorite um, formats are when we learn from each other. We also sometimes just invite uh, researchers and scientists to learn uh, which uh, new fields are there um, and what can we learn from it and how can we um, have another look at our lives um, and then um, we also discuss it with them and then the third part when you are part of the ministry of science and um, education um, research they also see you as you are as your money giver and then so most of the dialogues also about support and financial support you briefly now touched about touched on what happened during the pandemic, right? Um, science was sort of catapulted to the forefront of public consciousness and millions of people were watching, not only tracking case numbers, but also following the development of the vaccines. So do you think science has in the long term benefited from this time in the spotlight? Yeah, overall, I would say yes. Yeah, we, we had some very horrible examples where it not really benefited. Also one of our scientists was um, harmed by the uh, Bild Zeitung. She was one of them, Viola Priesemann, shown there as uh, C. Uh, they um, they um, uh, cut our um, um, uh, leisure time and uh, they, we are not allowed to celebrate now. And that was this horrible picture. Um, but um, overall, it was really great um, uh, that um, science got so much much intention and uh, attention and um, especially I would say um, that we also could um, discuss um, the process of research. Yeah, it's not only the results, but the process. And this is really important to explain the public that um, research is not done within a month. So this is a really um, hard um, achievement. You re really have to prove uh, your findings. You have to cross check them. You have to have other settings and uh, to prove all these results. And um, 
Yeah, I think that uh, when people really try to find out what is it about this um, uh, coronavirus and uh, try to see um, who is doing what kind of research, they also engaged a little bit more in the process. And this is uh, what I would say was really good for science and research. Yeah. Well, the pandemic also highlighted the need for effective science communication, right? So um, what do you think we can do to improve this communication? And do you think that scientists at all career levels should be involved? Yeah, let me uh, start with the second part. Um, yes, I would say that uh, scientists at all levels could be um, engaged, but not all scientists. Yeah, because um, people um, differ. That's why we really uh, uh, foster diversity. And there are some um, scientists who are really good in communicating and others not that good. And some maybe don't like it. So they should not do it when they don't like it and when they don't see that is good for them. So it's also a good option to say, no, um, I won't do that. So I would say that every scientist at each um, um, step of the career could involve. Um, and then what could we do to improve it? Yeah, we can provide training uh, and we do so. Um, and we also um, have to um, discuss maybe what should not be done. Yeah, because the worst thing is when we promise too much. Yeah, when we say that we within two years, when we get that kind of amount of money, we can solve that and that problem. And then, um, yeah, it, it really um, turns um, the public against us because They hear the promise and then they get not uh, the promise fulfilled, then maybe they s will sing again. So um, science and research will not help us anyway. And so they will be disappointed. And that uh, would be the worst thing for me. Yeah. And the media, I also would like that the media should also um, point out more the um, complications and um, the working process, process of science and research and not um, um, focus that much on the headlines or maybe sometimes uh, very short headlines. So more to explain what science is about. Yeah. So this is something we would, should learn about the communication in science. Sort of telling the whole story and yeah. also giving a bit of the background and maybe some of the struggles that were encountered to reach yeah. The, yeah. the final yeah. outcome. Yeah. That would be great uh, if there would be the time to do so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, science has always been important to build bridges between countries and people. In the current dialogue, this has become known as science diplomacy. So I was wondering how you see the role of scientists and science in the current conflicts happening mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah, this is, um, this is a real um, hard question because um, cooperation, um, international uh, cooperation is really to the heart of the Max Planck Society. We cooperate always internationally. Uh, nearly 50% of our directors are recruited from somewhere outside Germany. 50% um, are non-German. So we are really an international society and we do uh, cooperate internationally. And that's why we, for us, it's so important to uh, do this uh, even when the times are not that good and when there are conflicts arising. Um, and we have a very great example um, when it comes to Israel. Um, our former president Otto Hahn, he visited um, Israel and the Weizmann Institute in 59. That was six years before the official diplomatic relation between Israel and Germany started. So this was really something, a very good example for science diplomacy, uh, building bridges before we have this official lines of diplomacy. But we also should not be naive, yeah, um, because cooperation must always um, include that both sides uh, and uh, any researcher can conduct free research and there is no interference of governments or something else. And they all can uh, really um, public publish what they want and uh, publish um, 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 on an open source basis um, and do, do not hide any kind of findings um, during the research process. So, um, and this is something um, which should be always the ground of cooperation. Um, so shortly, I would say, Yeah, I, I totally believe in science diplomacy and in uh, the cooperation of people, but we should not be naive. Right. Now that we've talked 
about these big topics, maybe as a final question to conclude, I always find it interesting to find out what a typical day looks like for you. What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis in your current role? Yeah, um, so what is a typical day? Um, maybe the, 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 the is there is not no typical such day. a thing uh, <laughs> like a typical day. So each day is different. So that's what I love about my job. Um, sometimes we do a lot of meetings uh, in-house. So as a, a secretary general, I'm responsible for the uh, people in the headquarters um, in, um, in Munich for the Max Planck Society. And I'm also part of the managing board of the society. So these are twofold um, duties I have. Uh, so and um, when I'm uh, leading the um, Headquarters, so we had a lot of discussions with the colleagues there, maybe how to improve human uh, resource development or how to deal with the financial crisis we are facing now with the uh, inflation rate and the salaries uh, going up and the energy crisis. And the next day I um, also have uh, the um, have conferences uh, where I attend and uh, get to know our directors or maybe introduce to our directors which kind of new regulations we have to follow. Um, I'm also responsible for taxes, customs and things like that. And I'm also um, responsible for addressing our, um, our uh, the governments to um, provide some information, to um, uh, share our problems with them and uh, to provide the financial support we need and to negotiate with them. So there is no typical day and it never gets boring is what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really not boring. Yeah, it's it's great because we have all the fascinating people around us, the brilliant scientists and researchers and really passionate uh, colleagues uh, in the Max Planck Society headquarters. They really like to um, support um, the scientists. On that very positive no note, I'd like to end uh, today's breakthrough conversation. And thank you once again for your time and sharing your story with us. And to everyone connecting virtually, thanks also for your attention and your time. And we'll see you again tomorrow.